America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neofusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of neofusionism. Neofusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. So for today's episode, we're going to be looking at a book called The Greeks. And this is by H.D.F. Kiddo, and it was originally published in 1951. And it's, it's sort of an overview of ancient Greece and the ancient Greece civilization. Um, we've talked about the Greeks a little bit in previous episodes. We've kind of focused particularly on Aristotle uh, and maybe uh, Greek philosophy in general a little bit. We talked about Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. It's kind of, we've zeroed in on those three, and particularly Aristotle. But uh, this book doesn't give an awful lot of space to the Greek philosophers. Uh, it is much more about ancient Greece in general. Uh, it talks about the people, the tribes, uh, that formed Greece, the history. There's a lot of history in this book. Uh, but it's really, it's, it's sort of an, it's really good, actually. It's sort of a, an introductory, uh, book to give you the overview of Greece. The people, the land, the history. It talks about Homer. It talks a little bit about the philosophers. It talks about, it talks quite a bit about, uh, the governmental system, um, and the polis. And it talks, about uh, the rise of the polis and the fall of the polis. It talks about mythology and the Greek temperament uh, and life in general in ancient Greece. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's covered. There are a few points in this book that I want to pay special attention to. Uh, largely, I want to talk about the polis and the uh, social organization of the Greeks, and I want to talk about the Greek temperament. Uh, the Greek mind, and those two things relate to each other. Um, I think that shouldn't be too surprising that the Greek temperament created the Greek uh, social structure and vice versa. Uh, so that's really what I want to focus on today. I'll talk a little bit about the mythology too, um, but again, I'm not going to talk much at all about the philosophy uh, about Plato or Aristotle or any of that, I kind of have a vision in my mind of of uh, of the Greek temperament and and maybe my vision is not completely accurate. It's kind of it sounds odd to say, but it's kind of a, a, an idea of Aristotle that I'm finding does uh, it, it aligns with Aristotle but only to a certain extent. And I think that it's my vision is really more aligned with the general Greek temperament as perhaps manifested in a philosophical manner through Aristotle, uh, if that makes any sense. But I also think that there are some there are some conservative principles that the Greeks lived by, or what I would consider to be conservative principles. And I think that perhaps this form of conservatism or this conservative vision is a little bit maybe neglected in modern conservatism. I think there's something we can learn from the Greeks above and beyond just the dedication to reason uh, that we looked at in the last episode or that Ben Shapiro talked about in the last episode in uh, The Right Side of History. So, so this goes past that rationality um, and into more about like more closely related to what I find really compelling. One of the things I find really compelling about Aristotle in, in that his discussion of the golden mean and uh, virtues uh, being sort of a, a balance between different extremes of, you know, to not go too far in one direction or the other direction uh, 
in trying to find virtue, to not be fanatic about any particular strain of virtue, like to use a, a simple example, courage, to not be foolhardy, but also to not be timid, but to be courageous within reason, to not go too far, right? And to be generous within reason, but to not take that so far that you give away everything you own. It's, it's, it's foolish to go, to take a virtue so far it becomes an extreme. Now, to me, that's kind of a, a conservative approach because it's sort of prudent and careful and, uh, and, uh, it exhibits a sort of temperance of, of, um, personality that, that is, fundamentally conservative in my view it's prudent that's really what it is is it's prudent and it's moderate which to me indicates a sort of conservatism and it, and i think is a temperament that is fundamental to conservatism so so uh without further ado i'm going to start reading this uh the greeks by hdf kiddo uh and i'm going to get in here and start reading about the polis and we can maybe, you know, as you're as you're listening to me read, think about how uh, how this relates to a sense of community uh, that that might be undermined by the sort of radical individualism that we talked about back when we were looking at why liberalism failed by Patrick Deneen. Compare that kind of radical individualism and and. Um, uh, atomized individuals, a, a sea of unconnected people, compare that to how the polis is described in this book. And you can see, I think, a stark contrast. So he says, quote, polis is the Greek word, which we translate city-state. It is a bad translation because the normal polis was not much like a city and was very much more than a state. But translation, like politics, is the art of the possible. Since we have not got the thing, which the Greeks call the polis, we do not possess an equivalent word. From now on, we will avoid the misleading term city-state and use the Greek word instead. In this chapter, we will first inquire how the political system arose, then we will try to reconstitute the word polis and recover its real meaning by watching it in action. It may be a long task, but all the time we shall be improving our acquaintance with the Greeks. Without a clear conception what the polis was and what it meant to the Greeks, it is quite impossible to understand properly Greek history, the Greek mind, or the Greek achievement. End quote. So um, I'm going to read some more, obviously. That's just the real the opening section there that I wanted to mention. But yeah, we don't really have anything that's quite... Uh, equivalent to the polis in that manner. So he goes on to say, quote, There is no possible English rendering of such a common phrase as it is everyone's duty to help the polis. We cannot say help the state, for that arouses no enthusiasm. It is the state that takes half our incomes from us. Not the community, for with us the community is too big and too various to be grasped except theoretically. One's village, one's trade union, one's class are entities that mean something to us at once, but work for the community, though an admirable sentiment, is to most of us vague and flabby. In the years before the war, what did most parts of Great Britain know about the depressed areas? How much do bankers, miners, and farm workers understand each other? But the polis, every Greek knew, there it was, complete, before his eyes. He could see the fields which gave it its sustenance, or did not if the crops failed. He could see how agriculture, trade, and industry dovetailed into one another. He knew the frontiers, where they were strong and where weak. If any malcontents were planning a coup, it was difficult for them to conceal the fact. The entire life of the polis and the relation between its parts were much easier to grasp because of the small scale of things. Therefore, to say, it is everyone's duty to help the polis, was not to express a fine sentiment, but to speak the plainest and most urgent common sense. 
public affairs had an immediacy and a concreteness which they cannot possibly have for us. End quote. So uh, in that little section, you, you, he kind of describes how the, the people in the polis, they know each other, they relate to each other, they work together. Uh, it's kind of a unified community. It's, it operates as a unit in a way that our modern state and our modern communities uh, don't really operate. Uh, he goes on to say polis, then originally citadel, may mean as much as the whole communal life of the people, political, cultural, moral, even economic. For how else are we to understand another phrase in the same speech? The produce of the whole world comes to us because of the magnitude of our polis. This must mean our national wealth. Religion, too, was bound up with the polis, though not every form of religion. The Olympian gods were indeed worshipped by Greeks everywhere, but each polis had, if not its own gods, at least its own particular cults of these gods. Thus, Athena of the Brazen House was worshipped at Sparta, but to the Spartans, Athena was never what she was to the Athenians, Athena Polias, Athena guardian of the city. So Hera, in Athens, was a goddess worshipped particularly by women, as the goddess of hearth and home, but in Argos, Argive Hera was the supreme deity of the people. We have in these gods tribal deities, like Jehovah, who exist, as it were, on two levels at once, as gods of the individual polis and gods of the whole Greek race. But beyond these Olympians, each polis had its minor local deities, heroes and nymphs, each worshipped with its immemorial rite, and scarcely imagined to exist outside the particular locality where the rite was performed. So that in spite of the Panhellenic Olympian system, and in spite of the philosophic spirit which made merely tribal gods impossible for the Greek, there is a sense in which it is true to say that the polis is an independent religion, as well as political unit. The tragic poets at least could make use of the old belief that the gods desert a city when it is about to be captured. The gods are the unseen partners in the city's welfare, end quote. Okay, so in that section there, uh, we can see that they're, okay, the Greeks are all following a single overarching religion. They have the same Olympian pantheon of deities. But one deity may be seen as you know, the god of the city, like Athena, is the patron goddess of Athens. Whereas in other pol in other in, an, in another polis, Athena is just one goddess among many. So it's the same pantheon, but it's viewed differently for each particular polis, or for each particular people. They have their own version. And then he goes on to say, quote, Aristotle made a remark which we most inadequately translate, man is a political animal. What Aristotle really said is, man is a creature who lives in a polis. And what he goes on to demonstrate in his politics is that the polis is the only framework within which man can fully realize his spiritual, moral, and intellectual capacities. Such are some of the implications of this word. We shall meet more later, for I have deliberately said little about its purely political side, to emphasize the fact that it is so much more than a form of political organization. The polis was a living community, based on kinship, real or assumed, a kind of extended family, turning as much as possible of life into family life, and of course having its family quarrels, which were the more bitter because they were family quarrels. This it is that explains not only the polis, but also much of what the Greek made and thought, that he was essentially social. In the winning of his livelihood, he was essentially individualist. In the filling of his life, he was essentially communist. Religion, art, games, the discussion of things, all these were needs of life that could be fully satisfied only through the polis not, as with us, through voluntary associations of like-minded people or through entrepreneurs appealing to individuals. Moreover, he wanted to play his own part in running the affairs of the community. When we realize how many of the necessary 
interesting and exciting activities of the life the Greek enjoyed through the polis, all of them in the open air, within sight of the same acropolis, within the same ring of mountains or of sea, visibly enclosing the life of every member of the state, then it becomes possible to understand Greek history, to understand that, in spite of the promptings of common sense, the Greek could not bring himself to sacrifice the polis, with its vivid and comprehensive life, to a wider but less interesting unity. End quote. So, uh, I like that section there, um, number one, because uh, Ar- he mentions Aristotle's uh, statement, man is a political animal. But what, re- what Aristotle is really saying is that man is an animal that lives in a polis. So that the polis is fundamental to what makes humans work. What makes he- It's not just reason that makes humans uh, distinct, but it's the social arrangement of the polis that is fundamental to human flourishing, and only within the polis can humanity thrive, or can an individual person thrive. They, They require a community, and not just any community. It's not just that, oh, man just needs a community to thrive. There is a particular form of community that allows an individual to thrive, and that arrangement is the polis as Aristotle puts forward. Um, and I think that there may be something to that. I, I, to me, the polis sounds like a, a really wonderful way to organize life. Um, and the other thing that he mentions is that it was uh, it was perhaps obvious, particularly more so as time goes by in the ancient Greek world, that, the, that they would have to abandon the polis in order to be... Um, effective in a world in in which there are larger kingdoms and empires uh, that are contending for power. The, the polis is just not big enough to be the sort of contender uh, that, that the Greek would need it to be uh, in order to thrive in the greater Mediterranean world. But their attachment to the polis kept them from completely opening that up. Now, that didn't last forever. Eventually, uh, the polis did uh, sort of dissolve. Uh, I do want to jump to a section where he talks a little bit about democracy. This isn't a very long quote, but, but I like it. He says, quote, Everywhere, the polis gave a certain fullness and meaning to life, but most notably in Athens where political democracy was carried to its logical extreme. There are, of course, those who deny that Athens was a democracy at all, since women, resident aliens, and slaves had no voice in the conduct of affairs. If we define democracy as participation in the government by all the adult population of a country, then Athens was no democracy, nor is any modern state, for because of its size, every modern state must delegate government to representative and professional administrators, and this is a form of oligarchy. If we define it as participation in the government by all citizens, then Athens was a democracy, and we must remember that the normal Greek qualifications for citizenship was that at least the father, if not both parents, should have been citizens. The Greek state being, in theory and in sentiment, a group of kinsmen, not merely the population in a certain area. End quote. That's a part that, obviously that's a very short section, but it's a part that I thought it was important to bring attention to. Uh, Number one, because it's really remarkable that uh, that democracy was able to arise in you know this in the ancient world the way that it was and he goes into much more detail about the democracy but they, they were especially in Athens they were really into democracy um, they would have uh, the everything practically decided by everybody it was really a direct democracy and then there was a smaller council uh that would was more administrative uh and then there was a smaller council still but these were continually rotating and they were determined uh by by lottery uh 
in these membership in these in these councils. So nobody like ran for office to be in this council. It was all determined by lottery and they would have a certain number of representatives from each of the different tribes or clans of Athens. Uh, so that every every different interest group would be represented, the different families would all be represented. But it was really totally random who would serve in these in these councils. The only areas where people voted was for the generals, just because the, you know you couldn't have uh, just a, a random person pulled a name out of a hat, and, uh, you know, go command the uh, the navy. That obviously wouldn't work. But uh, so the generals were. Elected, but other than that, it was really, um, it was really a direct democracy, not a representative democracy in the same way that we have now. And it's remarkable that they were able to have that and maintain that, um, in that era. Uh, but also, the other reason that I wanted to read that section was because of the discussion about who a citizen was. Um, so what I gather from reading this is that citizenship was something that both men and women had. A woman could be a citizen, but a woman could not vote um, on, 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 on different proposals in the assembly, uh, couldn't speak to the assembly. Only men could. Um, I think that we've improved upon that by giving women a voice in the government of uh, – of modern nations, but I like when he says what the qualifications for citizenship are. It is that at least the father, if not both parents, should have been citizens. Nobody could just show up, have a baby, and have that baby become a citizen merely by the fact that the baby was born in Athens. There are no anchor babies in Athens. In order, and, and, even if the mother is a citizen, but the father is not a citizen, the child is not a citizen. The father of the child has to be a citizen. And I think that there's something to that, particularly um, as men were considered very clearly the heads of the household. So that the head of the household must be a citizen in order for the child to be a citizen. Um and I think that partly may track back to the concept of uh, men participating in the military would bring home women from foreign lands that they, if they had defeated. Um, and so the women who would come, the foreign women who would come to uh, Athens or other city states were largely, not always, obviously not always, but oftentimes uh, spoils of some war. Um, Whereas a man would never be spoils of war. He would be an a often an agent or maybe not an agent, but would at least have some sort of loyalty to some other, um, some other city state and would be there just maybe, maybe he's an outcast or whatever the circumstance may be. But the, the circumstance by which a foreign male and a foreign female would find themselves in the city would not be the same. Uh, and I think there's a distinction there. I'm not arguing for that exactly in our society, but uh, I do think that to have one parent be a citizen should be necessary for a child to be a citizen. Uh, they would think that the concept of anchor babies was absolutely absurd. Um, and it's a shame that we don't recognize that ourselves nowadays. So that's about all I want to say about that. Um, he does go on to talk about the decline of the polis, uh, why the polis sort of fell and, and why other systems uh, of government began to be more prominent. And I think that this section, when we talk about the fall of the polis, gets into some more of the Greek temperament. So he says, quote, The polis was made for the amateur. Its ideal was that every citizen, more or less, accordingly as the polis was democratic or oligarchic, should play his part in all of its many activities, an ideal that is recognizably descended from the generous Homeric concept of arete, uh, 
as an all-round excellence and an all-round activity. It implies a respect for the wholeness or the oneness of life and a consequent dislike of specialization. It implies a contempt for efficiency, or rather, a much higher idea of efficiency, an efficiency which exists not in one department of life, but in life itself. How far democratic Athens went in restricting the scope of the professional expert, we have seen already. A man owed it to himself, as well as to the polis, to be everything in turn. But this amateur conception implies also that life, besides being a whole, is also simple. If one man, in his time, is to play all the parts, these parts must not be too difficult for the ordinary man to learn. And this is where the polis broke down. Occidental man, beginning with the Greeks, has never been able to leave things alone. He must inquire, find out, improve, progress. And progress broke the polis. Let us look first at the international aspect. The modern reader who turns to those very different political philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, must be struck with their insistence on this, that the polis should be economically self-sufficient. To them, autarkia, self-sufficiency, is almost the first law of its existence. They would practically abolish commerce. Historically, at least, they seem to have been right. They both firmly believed that the Greek system of small polius was the only possible basis for a really civilized life, and it is a reasonable view. But such a system could work only if one of three conditions was fulfilled. The first is that the polius should conduct their affairs with an intelligence and a restraint of which the human race has not yet shown itself capable. The second is that one polis should be strong enough to keep order without wishing to intervene unduly in the private affairs of the others. For some time, and in a partial way, this was done by Sparta. The third is that the whole system should be so spacious that its members should not tread on each other's corns. In other words, that they should be self-sufficient. In the early days, this condition was more or less satisfied. But the opening up of the Mediterranean and the growth of commerce altered things. Commercial rivalries at once led to large-scale wars. In effect, the Greek world was shrinking, and collisions became inevitable. The development of Athens carried the process further. Her whole economic framework contradicted the law of autarkia, since from the time of Solon she came to depend more and more on exporting wine and oil and manufactured goods and on importing corn from the Black Sea and Egypt. She therefore had to control the Aegean in some form or other, and the Dardanelles in particular, but such control, as Greece roughly told her, was incompatible with the city-state system. The system, in fact, began to be unworkable, when it contradicted this basic law of its being. End quote. So here you have commerce. You have, you have a, a series of different polius, that's the plural of polis, uh, a, a system of these polius that are all um, independent and self-sufficient for the most part. Uh, but as commerce expanded, uh, Athens recognized the opportunities to exploit its particular uh, areas of expertise, its natural advantages uh, in the creation of wine and olive oil and manufacturers and importing food from elsewhere. And as this commercial system develops, then Athens realizes that certain trade routes need to be secured above and beyond just its immediate area. And uh, I don't want to get into all of the history of Athens and Greece, but suffice to say that uh, there formed a, sort of a league of polius that Athens was at the helm of, uh, which the existence of which contradicted uh, the the autarkia or the self sufficiency of the polis, and there were wars as a result of this scenario. Uh, I believe this is to some extent responsible for the Peloponnesian War. Uh, 
Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the point is that, th- that this system was not able to withstand, uh, the expanding commercial interests because it was not able to be, uh, self-sufficient. We find ourselves in a somewhat similar situation now. Our nations are larger and they are generally large enough to be somewhat self-sufficient depending on the nation. But inevitably, we find that we can be more uh, wealthy through trade. And it winds up creating this situation where we have the United States patrolling every area of ocean across the world. And not just ocean. We wind up policing everything everywhere uh, in order to maintain the flow of commerce. We see that now in Saudi Arabia and in Iran uh, at the time of this broadcast in in uh, September of 2019. So it's kind of a challenge because you you do sort of recognize, and even the author sort of recognizes here that uh, there's a definitely a case to be made that uh, the autarkia is the best way to achieve human flourishing. And another thing that I want to make a quick mention of in this section is when he talks about Arate. Early on, uh, he said that the very first thing he said was, its ideal was that every citizen should play his part in all of its many activities, an ideal that is recognizably descended from the generous Homeric conception of Arate as an all-round excellence and an all-round activity. So here we see a concept of Arate, which is essentially excellence, but it it is a, a broad excellence, so that you're excellent in uh, in all different aspects of your life. Um, you know, you're, you're physically fit. In order to be, you know, in order to have Arate, you have to be fit. You have to be smart. You have to be prosperous. You have to be virtuous. You have to be courageous, etc. The different types of virtues. I mean, virtue essentially is arete. And a lot, and I believe in Plato's works, he used the phrase arete and is oftentimes translated into virtue, which is challenging considering that our meaning of the understanding of the word virtue nowadays is not really the same thing as it was back then. And probably using the word excellence might be a little bit more close to what they really mean. Uh, but anyway, um, I'm going to I'm going to move on at this point to f- more. Uh, he, he talks more about the fall of the polis. Um, when he says, quote, for generations, Greek morality like Greek military tactics, had remained severely traditional, based on the cardinal virtues of justice, courage, self-restraint, and wisdom. Poet after poet had preached almost identical doctrines, the beauty of justice, the dangers of ambition, the folly of violence. It was a morality which was indeed no more practiced by all Greeks than Christianity was practiced by all Christendom, Nevertheless, like Christianity, it was an accepted standard. When a man did wrong, he was known to be doing wrong. Here was the foundation, simple and strong, on which a common life could be built. Here, too, is the source of the strength and simplicity of classical Greek art, and the only other European art which in these qualities approached the Greek, namely the art of the 13th century, was built on a similar foundation. But the 5th century changed all that. By the end of it, nobody knew where he was. The clever were turning everything upside down. And the simple felt that they had become out of date. To speak of virtue was to provoke the response, It all depends what you mean by virtue. And nobody knew. One reason why the poets went out of business. As within the last hundred years, new ideas and discoveries in the natural sciences have profoundly altered our outlook, upsetting for many men a traditional religion and morality, so that the devil has abdicated, weakness has ceased to exist, and all human shortcomings are the results of the system, or the product of environment. So, but more acutely, 
the bold philosophical speculations of the Ionian philosophers of the 6th and early 5th centuries had stimulated systematic inquiry in many directions, with the result that many received ideas in morality were badly shaken. There was Socrates, surely the most noble man who has ever lived. He had been interested in the speculations of the physicists, but gave them up as fruitless and trivial too, in comparison with the important question, how are we to live? The answer to this question he did not know, but he set himself to find out, by the rigorous examination of other men's ideas. This examination showed Socrates, and the eager young men who followed him about, that the traditional morality had no foundation in logic. No one in Athens could give a definition of any moral or intellectual virtue which would survive ten minutes' conversation with this formidable stonemason. The effect on some of the young men was disastrous. Their belief in the tradition was destroyed, and they put nothing in its place. Faith in the polis, too, was shaken, for how could the polis train its citizens in virtue, seeing that nobody knew what it was? So Socrates cried out upon the folly of democratic Athens, which was careful to consult the expert in a trifle like the building of a wall or a dockyard, but in the infinitely more important matter of morals and conduct allowed anyone to speak his uninstructed mind. The lofty aim of Socrates, and of Plato after him, was to put virtue on an unassailable logical foundation, to make it not a matter of traditional unexamined opinion, but of exact knowledge which could be mastered and taught. A laudable aim, but it led straight to the Republic, the professional antithesis of the amateur polis. For the training of the citizens in virtue, that is, the government of the polis, must be entrusted to those who know what virtue is. Plato's insistence on knowledge has the effect of splitting society into individuals, each of whom is expert in one pursuit only, and should be confined to that. The master art, the most important and difficult of all, is the political art, and he who has mastered that, when it has been discovered, must roll. So much for the polis, and its theory that the good life means taking a share in everything. This intellectual ferment produced, besides Socrates, a crowd of lesser men, the sophists, whose immediate impact on the polis was even more important. The term sophist had no disparaging sense at all. It was Plato who gave it that, for he disliked both their methods and their aims. They were not teachers, not inquirers, and their aims were practical, not philosophic. The word means teacher of Sophia, and Sophia is one of those difficult Greek words, meaning either wisdom, cleverness, or practical ability. Perhaps professor would be a rough modern equivalent to sophist. It had a similar range, from professors of Greek to professors of phrenology. And although some professors research, all teach and all are paid, which was a great reproach to the sophists. Some of them were serious philosophers, educators, or scholars. Others only cheap jacks, who professed to teach only the sublime art of getting on. Did you want to improve your memory? Did you want to be a $1,000 a year man? Some sophist would teach you, for a fee. Sophists went from city to city, lecturing on their particular subject, some indeed undertaking to lecture on any subject, but always for a fee. They were immensely popular with ambitious or inquiring young men, and the effect of their teaching may be indicated under two heads. In the first place, they, like Socrates, criticized the traditional morality. Some made serious attempts to give it a solid foundation. Others taught new and exciting doctrines, like Thrasymachus, who figures in the first book of the Republic. Thrasymachus is represented as a hard-boiled man, impatient with all hazy ideas about justice. Let us have something clear and precise. Pressed to give his own clear and precise idea, he declares, Justice is simply the interest of the stronger. A much greater man than this, Protagoras, held that there was no absolute good and evil, 
man is the measure of all things. That is, truth and morality are relative. We, who have seen to what base uses can be put the scientific doctrine of the survival of the fittest, can imagine without much difficulty what use men of violence and ambition could make of this dictum. It could be made to give an air of scientific or philosophic respectability to any wickedness. Men can do wicked things without being taught by sophists, but it was useful to learn arguments which would make them sound fair to the simple. But sophists who left ethics alone had just as disturbing an effect. Education had been a byproduct of the life of the polis, common, therefore, to all. Men of native ability went further than the rest, but all were on the same ground. The polis remained one. With the advent of the sophists, education became specialized and professionalized, open only to those who could and would pay for it. Now, for the first time, there was a real cleavage between the enlightened and the simple, with the natural result that the educated classes in the different cities began to feel that they had more in common with each other than with the uneducated of their own city, end quote. Okay, so there's a lot in that one. Um, working backward a little bit, uh, that that talk about the sophists and the ri the rise of the sophists and uh, the effect on education to essentially bring about this division between the educated and the uneducated, whereas previously everyone in the polis would have the same opportunities to be educated depending on how successful they were. Uh, but once these paid sophists are around, the more you can afford to pay the sophists, the more you're, you can learn or your children can learn. And it begins to create this more, it strengthens the division between the, the wealthier and the, and the commoners. Uh, and the, it, be, it begins to create this cosmopolitan elite. Uh, among the different polius who who recognize in each other kindred spirits more than they recognize kindred spirits within their own kinsmen of the polis. And that was one thing that undermined the polis. Uh, and he also talks about Socrates here. And Socrates questioning every traditional concept of morality, every traditional virtue, uh, every everything about the way the people of the polis went about their lives, he put to question. And we talked about this a little bit while Richard Weaver talked about it uh, in, in In Defense of Tradition, um, which was a book I reviewed quite a while back. Uh, but he makes much of the same point, that Socrates was in effect undermining the entire system of tradition and people's faith in the polis and people's faith in their leaders and people's faith in the traditions and religions that they had acquired from their forefathers. Everything was subject to this, uh, this rational inquiry. And because these are largely ephemeral concepts and much of their value uh, was imbued in the tradition so that people couldn't necessarily explain why they did things a certain way, but they did them that way because they always had. And, uh, and, and there's a value in that that I think sometimes people miss, that you might not know why things are done a certain way, but they're done that way because every other way has yielded destruction. It's a survival of the fittest of traditional uh, modes of behavior and rituals and ideas. Uh, those, those traditions and ideas that allow the polis to thrive and survive are the ones that have advanced. And perhaps some wiser man than you in the past may have understood why the whole system was set up that way. But just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that there is no function to it. Um, that, that kind of disintegration um, 
of the foundational principles of a society that Socrates was engaging in is very dangerous. And again, I've spoken about this at length, both when I looked at Edmund Burke, Richard Weaver talked about it, and it's come up again and again, and, and I bring it up here now because this author mentions the same principle. Uh, Socrates was a very intelligent man, but he moved too quickly to try to dismantle things that people couldn't readily explain to him. Uh, he undermined people's faith in the polis. And that is a very dangerous thing because the polis itself begins to collapse when people mistrust each other or, uh, or they see each other with some form of contempt. It didn't help to solidify the community to have that sort of undermining going on. Uh, so as you can tell, I'm, I'm rather skeptical about, uh, about Socrates sometimes. He's not necessarily my favorite philosopher. But anyway, from that point, when he talks about the decline of the polis, we got a chance to look at, uh, some of the, uh, temperament of the Greek and the, the Greek dedication to arete and wholeness and completeness, uh, and, and, uh, that's an important part of, of the environment that fostered Aristotle's golden mean, um, and it's something that I'm trying to explore here, and so I wanted to point I wanted to point it out. But it leads us to some more discussion on the Greek mind. And in that section, uh, he says, quote, "A sense of the wholeness of things is perhaps the most typical feature of the Greek mind." We have already met some notable expressions of this: the way in which Homer for all his love of the particular detail and the individual character, yet fixes it firmly into a universal frame, the way in which so many Greeks are several things at once, as Solon is political and economic reformer, man of business, and poet, the way in which the polis itself is not a machine for governing, but something which touches almost the whole of life. The modern mind divides, specializes, thinks in categories, the Greek instinct was the opposite, to take the widest view, to see things as an organic whole. The speeches of Cleon and Diodotus showed precisely the same thing. The particular issue must be generalized. Let us now try to illustrate this wholeness a little further, beginning with that very Greek thing, the Greek language. He who is beginning Greek is in constant difficulties with certain words which he thinks, ought to be simple, and in fact are, but at first seem unexpectedly difficult. There is the word kalos, and its opposite, iskros. He is told that the former means beautiful. He knows the Latin equivalent, pulture, and is quite happy. He reads of a kale polis, a beautiful city. Homer calls Sparta kalaganaikos, city of beautiful women, all is well. But then he reads that virtue is beautiful, that it is a beautiful thing to die for one's country, that the man of great soul strives to attain the beautiful, also that a good weapon or a commodious harbor is beautiful. He concludes that the Greek took an essentially aesthetic view of things, and the conclusion is confirmed when he finds that the word iskros, the Latin terpus, the English base or disgraceful, also means ugly, so that a man can be base not only in character, but also in appearance. How charming of the Greeks to turn virtue into beauty and vice into ugliness. But the Greek is doing nothing of the sort. It is we who are doing that, by dividing concepts into different, though perhaps parallel, categories. The moral, the intellectual, the aesthetic, the practical... The Greek did not. Even the philosophers were reluctant to do it. When Plato makes Socrates begin an argument by saying, You will agree that there is something called the kalon, we may be sure that he is going to bamboozle the other man by sliding gently from kalon beautiful to kalon honorable. The word really means something like worthy of warm admiration and may be used indifferently in any of these categories, rather like our word fine. We have words like this in English, 
The word bad can be used of conduct, poetry, or fish, in each case meaning something quite different. But in Greek, this refusal to specialize the meaning is habitual. The word hamartia means error, fault, crime, or even sin. Literally, it means missing the mark, a bad shot. We exclaim, how intellectualist these Greeks were. Sin is just missing the mark. Better luck next time. Again, we seem to find confirmation when we find that some of the Greek virtues seem to be as much intellectual as moral, a fact that makes them untranslatable since our own vocabulary must distinguish. There is sophrosyne, literally whole-mindedness or unimpaired-mindedness. According to the context, it will mean wisdom, prudence, temperateness, chastity, sobriety, modesty, or self-control. That is, something entirely intellectual, something entirely moral, or something intermediate. Our difficulty with the word, as with hamartia, is that we think more in departments. Hamartia, a bad shot, does not mean better luck next time. It means, rather, that a mental error is as blameworthy and may be as deadly as a moral one. And then, to complete our education, we find that in regions where we should use intellectual terms, in political theory, for example, Greek uses words heavily charged with a moral content. An aggressive policy is likely to be adikia, injustice, even if it is not hubris, wanton wickedness, while aggrandizement or profiteering is pleonexia, trying to get more than your share, which is both an intellectual and a moral error a defiance of the laws of the universe. Let us turn back to Homer for a moment. The poet of the Iliad had what some misguided people today think the most necessary qualification for the artist. He was class conscious. He writes only of kings and princes. The ordinary soldier plays no part in the poem. Moreover, these kings and princes are portrayed sharply with all the limitations of their class and time. They are proud, fierce, vengeful, glorying in war, though at the same time hating it. How could it happen that such heroes could become exemplars and a living inspiration to the later bourgeoisie? Because, being Greeks, they could not see themselves in any context but the widest possible, namely, as men. Their ideal was not a specifically knightly ideal, like chivalry or love. They called it arete, another typically Greek word. When we meet it in Plato, we translate it virtue, and consequently miss all the flavor of it. Virtue, at least in modern English, is almost entirely a moral word. Arete, on the other hand, is used indifferently in all the categories, and means simply excellence. It may be limited, of course, by its context. The arete of a racehorse is speed, of a cart horse, strength. If it is used in a general context of a man, it will connote excellence in the ways in which a man can be excellent, morally, intellectually, physically, practically. Thus, the hero of the Odyssey is a great fighter, a wily schemer, a ready speaker, a man of stout heart and broad wisdom, who knows that he must endure without too much complaining what the gods send, and he can both build and sail a boat, drive a furrow as straight as anyone, beat a young braggart at throwing the discus, challenge the Phaeacian youth at boxing, wrestling, or running, flay, skin, cut up and cook an ox, and be moved to tears by a song. He is, in fact, an excellent all-rounder. He has surpassing arete. So too has the hero of the older poem, Achilles, the most formidable of fighters, the swiftest of runners, and the noblest of soul. And Homer tells us in one notable verse how Achilles was educated. His father entrusted the lad to old Phoenix and told Phoenix to train him to be a maker of speeches and a doer of deeds. The Greek hero tried to combine in himself the virtues which our own heroic age divided between the knight and the churchman. That is one reason why the epic survived to be the education of a much more civilized age. The heroic ideal of Arete, though firmly rooted in its own age and circumstances, was so deep and wide that 
that it could become the ideal of an age that was totally different. End quote. All right, so, uh, yeah, we get to look back. That was a fairly long section there. Uh, but we get to look back there again at Arate. And, and uh, Arate was, a, was an idea that was very important in Homer. And in Homer describing um, Odysseus and Achilles uh, and the fact that these men were all around excellent. They could do all of these different things. They were, they were intelligent. They were, uh, a, a doer of deeds and a speaker of speeches was one of the phrases I think that he used. Um, and so I think that is a really important and valuable concept of virtue that we're going to use. Uh, we're going to try to, I think we're going to come back to that moving forward. Um, and he says that, particularly with the language, when he talks about the words, uh, how the word will mean something that applies uh, intellectually and applies uh, uh, morally, physically, practically, like beautiful. You know, we think of beautiful as physical, physically attractive, but the the concept of beauty and beautifulness is much more is much deeper uh so that it could apply to moral acts intellectual acts uh practical functions it's very wide ranging um and he talks about how we depart we our modern minds departmentalize everything um and yes, this is something that we are going to come back to because it kind of ties back to how he said that it was progress that destroyed the polis, that certain circumstances arose which caused that sort of, that sort of holistic view of virtues, uh, to be set aside. And virtues became specific, that there was this virtue applied to this part of life, and that virtue applied to that part of life. And that comes back to the way that we even use the word virtue. Like, we use the word virtue, and this was something that Shapiro mentioned in the last episode, uh, in referencing something that Jonathan Haidt had said, how virtue nowadays means particularly means moral behavior, um, trading off something of your own benefit in order to uh, provide benefit to someone else. Some sort of altruistic behavior is virtue. Self-sacrifice is virtue and moral. When we speak of morality, being moral, what we mean is being good as opposed to evil. So what we mean by that is largely uh, giving of ourselves or not being selfish or concerning ourselves primarily with the well-being of others. Um, that is kind of being good, being kind, being generous, concerning yourself with other people at your own expense. That is a totally different sense than arete. Uh, I'm sure you can recognize the difference when, when I point to it. It's not the same. The, the value system is very different. And it has been compa not only compartmentalized, but one area has been advanced while other areas are neglected. So that we don't have this sort of, okay, well, we've separated arate into uh, usefulness and beauty and uh, strength and compassion and blah, blah, blah. I mean, we have departmentalized our sense of excellence in that way, but we have prioritized uh, in our sense of correct behavior, we have largely prioritized this sort of uh, generosity and kindness as the beginning and end of what makes moral behavior. Um, its Its definition is constricted. And the other ways in which one can be excellent, they're still, they're still important, but they're important in a different way, I think. Um, and, and, and we're going to explore this in more detail. I, I've got a couple books coming up that are really going to dig into this concept. And, and if you're, if you're well read, you might already have an idea of some of the books 
that I'm going to be looking at as we explore this. Uh, but I'm going to leave it as a surprise when I when I crack those books open. So, so that's uh, that's that section about the Greek mind. Um, then, sort of closing out that section, there's just one last part I want to read here about that point. He says, quote, This instinct for seeing things as a whole is the source of the essential sanity of Greek life. The Greeks had their passions. Their political records are no freer than other people's from paroxysms of savagery. The hungry exile would ruin his city if only he could return and rule, whether he was oligarch or democrat. But their standard in all their activities was a sane balance. It is difficult to think of a Greek who can be called a fanatic. The religious excesses of the East or of the Middle Ages find no place in the life of classical Greece, nor, for that matter, the less interesting excesses of our own age, such as commercialism. The Greek knew mystical ecstasy and sought it in cults of Dionysus, but this was one part of a definite scheme of things. There is great significance in the religious legend that for three months in the year Apollo left Delphi and Dionysus took his place. Euripides draws a portrait of a fanatic, Hippolytus, the pure and virginal worshipper of the virgin goddess Artemis, who will pay no honor to the love goddess Aphrodite. He is the kind of whom the Middle Ages might have made a saint. Euripides makes of him a tragic misfit. Man must worship both these goddesses, antagonistic though they may seem. Hippolytus is destroyed by the Aphrodite whom he slights, and his Artemis can do nothing to protect him. End quote. I like that part because it begins to talk about uh, the gods and the, and the relation to the gods and the, the fanaticism that we see have seen in... Uh, in well, he, he points to the, the Middle Ages, um, the absolute uh, saintly devotion to Christ or, or to religion or to in the, in the Middle East or I'm sorry, in the Far East, uh, the, the absolute dedication to, uh, Buddhist transcendence that at the ascetic, uh, approach of self-denial and, and it, it comes across as fanaticism compared to the Greeks who said, don't take this one goddess and prioritize her to such an extent that you refuse to worship the other gods and goddesses. Uh, the goddesses Artemis and Aphrodite may seem conflicting, but they need to both be honored. This isn't to say that you, w you wouldn't take a primary deity to say that this is like, like the city of Athens or the polis of Athens takes Athena as its patron goddess, but at the same time makes room for to accommodate the other gods and goddesses. That same sense of balance applies to the religious. That You don't just go in one direction entirely uh, to a degree of fanaticism and finding yourself off balance. Uh, he says that that person is portrayed as a tragic misfit. That is not the correct way to be. That, to me, that sort of balance seems like a... A little bit more easygoing and a little less fanatic. A little bit more sane. He uses the word sane, um, and I think that applies. Uh, and a little bit more, to me, a little bit more life-embracing um, rather than life-denying. I think that the fanaticism, both in the Middle Ages and in the Far East, becomes life-denying. Um, to recognize the multiplicity of forms, the multiplicity of virtues, the multiplicity of gods and goddesses, uh, this kind of ever changing, ever shifting balance, never, never striving fanatically toward perfect balance. I mean, that's its own form of fanaticism to like make sure that you spend the exact amount, same amount of time worshiping each of all of the Greek gods and goddesses. That would not even be possible. There are quite a few of them. I mean, I suppose it would be possible, but, but that's its own form of fanaticism so that you can take one to whatever you feel 
are the are your the 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 gods that or goddesses that speak to you. Okay, these are the ones that you concern yourself with primarily, but never exclusively. Um, that that kind of openness to it's like a tolerance of other other uh, deities and and the Greeks would bring in and let go gods and goddesses over time as they would interact with new people they would absorb their gods other gods no longer spoke to them they would let those gods fall to the wayside it was it was evolving over time it was uh, it was uh, pl- embracing the plurality and embracing the balance and these the pl- plurality and the balance and the moderation and the prudence and the wholeness, these are all things that I've brought up at a couple different points in previous podcasts that I think can and should form a sort of a, um, a foundation for a, for a modern conservative uh, naturalistic s- set of virtues. So so that was why I wanted to talk about that. He does mention also reason. He talks about reason and rationality. Now, I talked about this a, a fair amount in in the last book, particularly when I was reading a section where Ben Shapiro talks about it, but, but I think we've established that the ancient Greeks did have a a reverence for uh, rational exploration of the material world and the attempt to infer meaning and values and uh, direction in life from exploration of of nature and and how much particularly the philosophers really valued reason and rationality um, and I think that they may have valued reason and rationality to an excess. Uh, when we now through, through rational exploration, we've discovered, and I think it just comes right back to human intuition, but now it's backed up by science that we're not actually rational decision makers. We have a lot of irrational parts to us, and those are not things that are f- character flaws, are, are, are various ways of being irrational. Or those are not, or emotional, or or what have you, or or our passions. Those are not character flaws. They're fundamental components of humanity that we have acquired through uh, the trials and tribulations of the evolutionary process. It's part of who we are, and it's part of who we are for a reason. So, um, so while he talks about reason and rationality, understand that the Greek is not. The Greek, the average Greek is not so thoroughly bound in reason and rationality as sometimes it can be made to appear. And I think that there's an extent to which Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but beginning with Socrates in the same area that I kind of critique, at the same time, maybe there was not the proliferation of reason and rationality that we have today. And so maybe they swang the pendulum too far in that direction toward a focus on reason and rationality that in our modern world, which is so much built upon reason and rationality, it might be wise to say, all right, I believe in reason. I recognize reason. I also recognize the emotions, the uh, the passions of human life, the sentiments, the attachments we have for our traditions, be they logical or otherwise. Uh, there's a lot more to human life than just rational behavior and 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 whatnot. That's not actually what defines, like like Shapiro says, that what defines. A human, or he he basically inf- in, interprets Aristotle as saying that what defines a human is our rationality. But Aristotle says what defines human is is our life in the polis. In other words, our existence in a community uh, and and a deliberate community. Um, and so there and so i guess i just want to say that there's more there's more to greek thought than just a focus on rationality and there should be more to our modern thought than just the the focus on rationality uh so he he says this and i'm only going to read a small section i don't want to read a lot of it because we've talked about it before but he says quote now we must turn to another feature of the greek mind its firm belief in reason there is a pleasing though possibly libelous story of a Chinese philosopher, 
who was asked what the earth rested on. A tortoise, said the philosopher. And what does the tortoise rest on? A table. And what does the table rest on? An elephant. And what does the elephant rest on? Don't be inquisitive. Whether Chinese or not, this is emphatically not Hellenic. The Greek never doubted for a moment that the universe is not capricious. It obeys law and is therefore capable of explanation. Even in pre-philosophical Homer, we find this idea for behind the gods, though sometimes identified with them, is a shadowy power that Homer calls ananke, necessity, an order of things which even the gods cannot infringe. Greek tragedy is built on the faith that in human affairs it is law that reigns, not chance. In Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, to take a rather difficult example, it is prophesied before Oedipus is born that he will kill his father and marry his mother. He does these things in complete ignorance, but it makes nonsense of the play to interpret this as meaning that the man is the plaything of a malignant fate. What Sophocles means is this, that in the most complex and apparently fortuitous combination of events there is a design, though what it means we may not know. It is because the gods can see the whole design that Apollo could foretell what Oedipus would do. In Aeschylus, the law is simpler. It is moral law. Punishment follows hubris as the night the day. It was because of this firm faith in law that Whitehead called the Greek tragic poets, rather than the early Greek philosophers, the true founders of scientific thinking. End quote. So, um, he brings up the concept here of ananke. This is something that I like. Uh, necessity. Ananke means necessity. Um, and, and I want to just digress for a moment here. I'm not as well schooled about the concept of ananke as I would like to be, and as I expect to be through this ongoing exploration into Greek thought. But to me, when I think about fate, I think about it several things. Like, for example, and I know I've, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain I've mentioned this in the past, but uh, for example, to roll a set of dice looks like chance. You don't know what the dice are going to roll. Nobody knows. You could bet money on it. You don't know how it's going to come up. It's chance. It seems random what those dice... You draw a card randomly from a deck of cards. It seems random. But in a deterministic world, it's not random. There's nothing that is random. In a world in which necessity or a nonke uh, fills everything, then there is no random card drawn. There is no random roll of the dice. It's all part of a design. That doesn't mean an intelligent design. It means it's all part of a systematic universe um, where everything is tied together logically through cause and effect. Now, we've previously seen the word logos uh, described as meaning... Now, logos is, is used by all sorts of people and religions and philosophers to mean different things. The first philosophical use of the word logos, I believe by Heraclitus, is describing an orderly system of the universe. We saw this also in the last episode, uh, Ben Shapiro's book, The Right Side of History. He, he spoke of this. He, he mentions nous and logos. First described as nous, then described as logos. My understanding, limited though it may be, is that nous really means mind. So nous is the human rationality, and logos is the external natural rationality. So that we use our nous, our minds, to comprehend the logos, or the interconnected rational framework of the world. Where does a nonke fit into that? Now, a nonke is more often associated with fate than with logic. So, like, a nonke is, is the mother of Moiria, which are the fates, the three fates. Um, I forget their names off the top of my head, but, uh, who, who set out 
the string that people follow in the course of their life. It's like it's envisioned like a string. There's one person that un- that gives out the string. There's one person that uh, guides the person along the string, and then there's one person at the end of the string, a tropos, which represents death. And every person follows this string through their life. That's fate, and that's tied up with the concept of a non K. So when I think about a non K, to me, I understand it as that portion of reality which looks to us to be fate. Right? Like the roll of the dice or the draw of the card looks like chance. It looks like chance. It looks random, right? But fate is not random. They're two different things, really. Chaos and fate, chaos and, de- and, and necessity and determinism are, and randomness and determinism are two different things. It looks like randomness, but it's really fate. It's really, and in, in, in a naturalistic, non-supernatural manner, you, you, I would just say that it's, it's really design. It's really, uh, preordained. But it, but we don't understand it. The same thing that, that like when, when I talked about chaos theory and complex systems that we don't have the capacity to comprehend, like weather in the distant future, even one year's time, even in one day's time sometimes. But if you want to really get down to it, a year's time in a deterministic world, the weather a year from now is already determined. But we don't know what it's going to be like on, you know, this day in one year's time, what the weather will be. We, it's too complex for us to understand. It's the same thing as the roll of the dice is too complex for us to understand, particularly in a casual manner. When you roll the dice, you can't comprehend, you can't, you can't compute ahead of time what the dice are going to come up. So it looks like chance. It looks like, and to me, that's mystery. It's like mystery. It's like, it's that which is unknowable. But doesn't it, the unknowableness of it doesn't take away from its deterministicness. That's a non-K. Those parts of the logos that are hidden from us, that are veiled, right? The veiled aspects of the world, the, the inner workings of the human mind remain to us to some extent veiled. That's a non-K in my understanding. Logos is the principle that despite the fact that you can't see it, it's still all connected. It's thoroughly connected in every way. That's logos. Okay. So that was why I wanted to bring that up because a non K to me is, is an important concept. Okay. So there are, there is a section in here about uh, mythology that is really pretty interesting. I was originally going to read it, but I'm running along on the time and I think that I've already covered a number of the key points that I wanted to mention in that section, uh, but I can't recommend this book highly enough if you want to get a real good understanding of the Greek temperament, above and beyond just what you're going to find when you study Greek philosophy. That's only going to give you a slice of the picture um, of who the Greeks were and how they approached the world, and I think that we can get a lot of value, not just out of the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle and the Hellenic philosophers and so forth, but out of the depth of all of Greek history, the early Greek history, the, the poets, Homer, uh, and the, and the other politicians and other writers and people that we've, that we've got access to who can tell us a little bit about Greek life. I think the Greeks are a, a very important, fascinating people and much of the Greek culture and ideas can be seen, as I mentioned in the last episode, as a sort of center of European history. Obviously, they're not geographically central to Europe. They're more peripheral. But the ideas of the Greeks did a lot to provide some of the foundations for the Renaissance, the foundations for the Enlightenment, and much of what we uh, view as Western civilization today can be traced back to the Greeks. And so I think they should, that we should hold them up as, as a central priority, not just in the rationality of the philosophers, but in their whole holistic approach to life. 
that's something that we can adopt and it's a fairly conservative, I believe a fairly conservative disposition that can uh, go a long way to helping the modern American conservative movement find a sort of virtuous footing. So uh, with that said, I guess I'm going to wrap this episode up. Um, that was HDF Kiddo in the book uh, called The Greeks. And up next, I'm just going to give you a heads up about the next episode because I'm excited about it. Uh, we're going to look at Myths to Live By by Joseph Campbell. And so the areas of Greek mythology that I didn't hit, hit on today, uh, some of the concepts are going to get touched upon next episode. Um, and then there's a lot of really interesting stuff coming down the pipeline after that, but I'm going to leave you guys uh, in a state of a non-K until then. So thanks for tuning in. Check out my social media. It's pretty easy to find. Search for Neo Fusionist. I come right up. It's not difficult to find my pages or to provide me with feedback at neofusionist at gmail.com. And that's all for now. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.